So, uh, so last week, uh, we talked a little bit already about this enormous transformation that uh, the legal profession and the entire legal system uh, is going through. Um, and we'll talk about that you know, much more. Uh, but much of that change is driven by, um, by startups, by disruptive uh, startups. And um, a lot of the, what we think are some of the most exciting ones are uh, coming out from, from Stanford. Uh, and so I'm going to just mention uh, the ones of the last couple of years to you um, in, uh, in reverse uh, chronological order. Um, so we spoke last week about uh, case text. Uh, which is the most recent one, um, the you know, kind of new way to annotate uh, the case law. A company that um, uh, was a Y Combinator incubated company, uh, got funding uh, from, from, among others, Ashton Kutcher. Uh, mm -hmm. Ashton Kutcher is investing in, in legal technology. So, it's, uh, you know, the time has come for legal technology. Uh, and um, yeah, so we had to, Pablo tell us more, more about that. Um, um, but Andrew raised an interesting point before, uh, which was he's like felt a little bit uncomfortable to think it's a, it's a for-profit venture, yet they're asking people to annotate and uh, contribute, uh, you know, their annotations for, for free. Uh, and so it's a little bit different than, than we can hear. I think that's a valid point and they have to find a, a good, good response to that, to that criticism. Um, next one is Judy Kada, came out uh, in uh, 2013. Uh, so their slogan is, you know, uh, the, uh, basically building the legal genome, or mapping the legal genome. And so what they're trying to do is to uh, build structure into, into legal text, into case law, uh, that, uh, you know, makes uh, makes it more accessible for computers and therefore uh, enable you know smarter and much deeper searches. A uh, company that's funded by by Peter Thiel. So uh, yeah, so one of the co-founders is uh, also a Stanford Law School grad, uh, and 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 then there's a, a, a Google former Google employee who was involved in, in Google Google Scholar uh, case law project. Um, uh, so so that's a very a very interesting company too, um, and that came out at about the same time as Ravel, which is also uh, both co-founders of Stanford Law Grads, uh, Codex Fellows. Uh, there, the idea was uh, to use sort of a visual interface to show how cases are connected and, and make that you know these interrelations much more accessible using sort of clustering technology to to do that, and. <clears throat> And it's also went recently through its second second round of funding. Uh, also, very interesting company that I think is already working actively with uh, with our library, uh, getting getting uh, JDs to to actually use the the, uh, the system in their in their research for their for their um, for their courses. Uh, then we have Law Gift, which is also founded by Stanford Law Grads, uh, a couple of LLMs who were. Uh, working in, in big law, um, came here, actually started out, hey, comment in please, um, started out uh, as the initial idea was uh, for them to see that there was um, sort of a, a ton of people with legal needs who don't have access to lawyers, uh, and yet there's, you know, there's a ton of uh, folks in law schools who, who want to get, act, uh, who want to actually practice their legal skills, and um, and uh, you know they figured out you know maybe a, a, a platform would help kind of connect them and sort of involve like supervising attorneys. So so that model has kind of morphed into uh, you know this platform for lawyers and now it's uh, for lawyers and and mostly uh, folks starting companies currently. Um, that's been out since 2012. Um, uh, 2012, I think, yeah, uh, and. And has recently had its, its public launch, it was a quite a bit of media coverage on that. Uh, then, also in 2012, uh, we spun out from Stanford, we spun out uh, CIPIX. Um, CIPIX stands for uh, the Stanford for Public Exchange. Uh, CIPIX is a new technology that uh, 
tries to take out some of the transaction costs in, in uh, content transactions, make it easier for uh, people in higher, for instructors in higher education to share content with students legally. Um, that's now a company that's, uh, that's serving uh, other universities. And, and uh, uh, yeah, also quite, quite interesting technology. And then, uh, last but not least, the first uh, spin out from Stanford Law School uh, was Lex Machina. And then we'll learn a lot more about Lex Machina, Lex Machina today. But really what it was is, uh, you know, it's Professor Lemley's uh, brainchild. Uh, he's an a empirical patent scholar. And he saw that, you know, there's this uh, sort of uh, really lack of empirical information about what's going on in the, in the patent system. And he figured, you know, if we apply, you know, if you put a database together trying to track all uh, sort of uh, patent relevant, uh, more generally IP relevant information, then we'll get a much better sense of what's what's going on, and and uh, and he, I think, he was also a little bit inspired by um, the securities class action clearinghouse, which is really the first database we built here at the law school in the late 90s, the early 2000s, which tracks all securities class uh, class actions. That was Professor Grundfest's idea, and uh, that became a really popular resource. At some point, I think a quarter of all the traffic that came to Stanford Law School was just going to the, to the securities class action clearinghouse. So uh, I think what, what's, uh, what unites all the uh, founders of these, um, these companies is that they, you know, they identified you know, a pain, a sense of painful thing to do in, in legal research or in some activity, and they figured, you know, well, it doesn't really have to be that way. That's a better way of doing things. And they, you know, entrepreneurial how Stanford students are, they just went out and, and tried to do a better job uh, using technology. So, so last week we talked a little bit about, you know, all these many things that are going on. We tried to offer, you know, um, these kind of three buckets to, to kind of make sense of, uh, of the world of uh, legal technology. And, uh, you know, those are, again, legal document management, uh, legal infrastructure, and computational law. And again, you know, legal document management, document management is concerned with you know creation and retrieval of legal documents, um, where the computer doesn't understand the, the text of those documents. Uh, legal infrastructure means um, basically systems that connect the stakeholders in the legal system more efficiently. Uh, also, you know, a lot of the new, new kind of databases kind of fall into that category. And then uh, computational law, which is you know where the computer can actually make sense of data and laws and 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 make some some decisions also. And so if we kind of use this kind of organization tool or framework to classify all the startups that came out of Stanford, uh, you know how, where would they fall in this kind of spectrum? And uh, uh, here's like. Um, how uh, how we think they would kind of uh, be classified. Um, so so case text and gravel and judicata are really concerned with uh, with uh, legal document management. The computer really doesn't understand the content of, of the legal documents, but you know makes it easier to get to the actual legal documents. Uh, Lex Machina, we would see, even though you know initially it was. Uh, you know, mostly concerned with also getting to the legal documents, but it's really more like you know a, a, a database for for uh, for this kind of content and falls more into the legal infrastructure uh, a bucket. Law gifts, you know, being a system that connects uh, lawyers with uh, people with legal needs in a more efficient way, also a legal infrastructure uh, play. And then CIPIX, uh certainly has aspirations to be a, a computational law uh, system at some point, but currently is more, you know, can price differentiate. The system understands, you know, that you guys are Stanford students uh, and therefore gives you a different price than somebody who's not affiliated with Stanford. Uh, but it doesn't really do any more kind of sophisticated uh, application of different rules to different people. Um, and, you know, so it's 
currently somewhere between legal infrastructure and computational law. And uh, and yeah, so those you know those buckets are not completely hard, you know hard and fast. You know, there's some systems kind of fall somewhere in between. But you know, the main idea is that you use that as some kind of an organizing uh, organizing tool for you know a sense making tool for when you see all the many things that are going on in, in the legal space and um, and yeah and you know we'll hear a lot more also from Professor Katz about some some other exciting uh, companies and developments. So so with that um, uh, are there any questions on on this Stanford legal tech startup activities? No? Anything? All right well then let me welcome our speaker today, Professor Dan Katz. We're extremely fortunate to have Professor Katz with us. Uh, Professor Katz is the leading authority on big data law. Well, that's and, massively <laughs> overstated. Uh, it, it's yeah. an understatement. Yeah. So, um, and, uh, and on quantitative uh, legal prediction, uh, he's, uh, uh, he's a professor at uh, Michigan uh, State University College of Law. Was also a co-director of uh, the Reinvent Law Lab, um, which does really interesting work uh, in the legal technology space. And uh, he's widely published, and his work has been covered by all the major news outlets, including the New York Times and uh, and you know Financial Times and Huffington Post and so on and so forth. And and uh, he will be. Um, Talking to us about big data law and quantitative uh, legal prediction and uh, and how he stopped worrying about uh, uh, the, f the future of law. Or no, what's the title of your paper again? Uh, I've now forgotten. Uh, uh, how I learned to stop worrying, start preparing for the future. All right, so, yeah, the future. Okay, so <laughs> get prepared for the future. Okay. Yeah. so he will help us get prepared for the okay. future. Okay, so that's a yeah. hard, hard undertaking. <laughs> level, you know, right, right. Our best. And so he, he will speak for about um, you know fifty minutes or so. We'll take a, a short five minutes break sure. around uh, three o'clock. And um, Elizabeth actually signed up to be our commentator today, so she will kind of lead off the discussion with the first couple of questions. So um, so with that, okay, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Good. Plugged in here. Let me, uh, let me start by giving you my contact information. I live in a bunch of different places, but uh, this is my blog, computationallegalstudies.com, computationallegalstudies.com. I also am the co-director of ReadMet Law Laboratory, uh, and you can hit me up on Twitter, at computational. As an early person on Twitter, I was very proud to have jumped this. There's a million people who want that in every computational underscore field, and I squatted that early, so it's not available uh, <laughs> for any price. Yeah. So I want to start by, by orienting all of this a little bit in a broader perspective about the sort of three phases of innovation that are taking place in, le in legal. The first, the first of, uh, of this is the sort of traditional way that this, this topic gets um, presented to law students and um, is uh, when you see something called law and entrepreneurship, it's usually lawyers representing entrepreneurs. That's the sort of classic version, and most people think that's what law and entrepreneurship is. And it certainly is an important part of it. It's certainly in a place like this, there's a lot of activity in the startup space, and there's a need for lawyers uh, 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 to, to help you know, build term sheets, uh, um, uh, 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 incorporation, patents, a whole range of, of, of legal work. And that is a form of... Of, of capturing innovation um, that lawyers have been doing for a very long time, particularly in this 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 uh, area of the world. Um, the second part, the second now that is not what we're going to talk about today. That's extremely well covered, pretty much everywhere. Um, this is a second point I just want to make. If I had to characterize what you're doing in your doctrinal classes, it's largely to do this, which is to be an innovator in the substantive domain of law. So you read a lot of cases, and then they try to give you the one you haven't had, and you try to basically interpolate you know, what, what, what's going to happen in this new case. And what that's best case scenario designed to set you up to do is to be an innovator in the, substantive, uh, uh, the substance of law. And so probably the, most cla the classic treatment of this question, there's a ton of others of this, is poison pill defense. 
Marty Lipton, you know, why you know of Wachtell is because Marty Lipton uh, um, developed the poison pill defense and made a tremendous amount of money and put Wachtell really on the map. This is why it happened. And, you know, so um, uh, uh, this has been called the, the greatest innovation in corporate law since the, since the trust era in the, in the 1880s. That was innovation of a very particular type. That substantive innovation in the law that led that person to, you know, be very successful and to put that law firm really on the map as being a, a permanently a top shelf law firm. Uh, within, within this domain, of course, here at Stanford and, every, and a lot of other institutions, there's these other, these, there's changes in the world and that brings about uh, you know the need for lawyers to to think about the problem, think about all the problems that are going to be attended to it. So this is just like a small subset of the set of things in the world where the there's there's going to be a need for innovation on the substance of law, and that's something that you can you know do and you can be a part of. And this is again on a very abridged list, but just to give you a taste for it. This is mostly what I'm going to talk about today, which is innovation on the business of law or process of law, and that's that's about transforming the way lawyers work. And um, there's a lot of different things happening on the, in this space right now, and that's part of, I think, what you're going to hear about throughout this course. Um, and this is just a little taxonomy I put together, which is you spend a lot of time doing substantive legal, developing your substantive legal expertise, and that's quite appropriate. Um, these are the other pieces of the puzzle, as I see it. These four pieces, really, all the innovation is some ensemble of one of these four, of this plus some ensemble of the others. And so I... Uh, I won't go into great detail about this, but this is just sort of a, a little taxonomy I put together just to sort of describe the four pillars of innovation or sort of these things. And so here at Stanford, of course, there's a lot of things particularly happening on this, this side and this side of the spectrum, but all of it's relevant. All of it's relevant. Now, I want to say, you know, law firms get a lot of flack and, you know, a lot of that's deserved, but I want to point out there are some firms that have been very aggressive and have been using these types of things as a strategy. The most well-known one is Safe Our Shot. And you should know about that if you don't know about what they've been doing. Basically, their two life cycles in, they started in 2004, 2005, somewhere around there. And they've been bringing Six Sigma and Lean into what they do in terms of thinking about producing legal outputs as a manufacturing process and bringing tech and bringing data to bear on every aspect of what they do. Um, but most of the innovation that you're having in legal spaces in Let's Not Startup, and that's really starting to take hold. And uh, this is something that Josh Kubicki, who's a major uh, person who really tracks a lot of what's going on in the legal tech space, is if you went to AngelList um, in 2009, you'd find about 15 startups there in 2009. So as the financial crisis really takes hold and the clients start looking for alternative places to get more for less, you, you see all of these entrepreneurs say, we finally have somebody who actually is interested in buying this stuff, and that's where we are today. So there's a lot happening, and I'm certainly not going to say that all these startups are going to make it. You know what the, light, what the odds are. They're not great. But the things that people cluster around tend to be good, even if one company or another, who knows which ones will carry it off. Um, what are they doing? There's five things that they're doing. But I would say, in general, what they're doing is really the R&D function of the legal industry. That's basically been outsourced outside of law firms. You can imagine another world where law firms did their own R&D. And without, outside of Safe Harbor Shaw, I couldn't name a single law firm that's really doing R&D in a serious sort of way. But, you know, so we can imagine that as being the case, but that's really proven elusive. That's what these folks are doing. It's basically the R&D of the legal industry has been outsourced to startups. And so here's sort of five things, the five plays people are making in the space right now. And some organizations are doing some ensemble of this, including, you know, the startup law firms, your Axioms, your Clear Spires, what have you. One of these five things. Labor arbitrage. Process and technology arbitrage, regulatory arbitrage, it's definitely what Axiom, ClearSpire are doing. Um, so in your ethics class, you've learned about Rule 5.4. If you haven't, you will. You know, non-lawyers can't own law firms. Well, this is a, those, company, those companies are basically creating, ar they're arbitraging the fact that they've developed a different business model that allows there to be capital to be raised by something like, you know, this is what Axiom and ClearSpire are doing. I, again, I could go into great detail about all of these things. Today I'm here to talk about um, this last topic, predictive analytics, but I wanted to orient that or seat that in the broader sea of what's going on. I think uh, it's a real interesting time to be in law school, to come out of law school. It's, uh, it's, it's, there's definitely some turbulence, but there's also a ton of opportunity if you sort of, you, you can strike on it. So it's, you know, it's the double-edged sword. Uh, uh, and so, uh, so now I want to talk a little bit about prediction, legal prediction, and how it fits into all of this, but I wanted to at least, you know, to give you a 10,000 foot perspective on what I see going on. So I talk pretty fast. I've been told. Uh, uh, so if it's too fast for you at any point, you're welcome to raise your hand and, and, and I can provide some clarification. 
where right. necessary. Okay, also, here we are. If, if there's any 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 question about any kind of terms, you know, like the rule something. Oh, rule right? five point four. Uh, you know, don't, don't be shy. Rule five point four. I mean, you know, MP, yeah, when you yeah. get that MPRE coming up, you're going to have to know that, right? Right, but not all the students are law students. Oh, they're not all law students. Okay, well, uh, 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 lawyers, you know, the one thing that's definitely like distinguishing about uh, about the law, uh, about the or you know, industrial organization of the law, is that law firms are partnerships. They're not corporations. They can't raise capital as a result of that, basically, except putting their own money on the line. And that's an intrinsic limit on the types of innovations that are possible, because you can't really monetize the upside. In the, the US. US. in the U.S., right? So one of the great developments that's happened is in the U.K. right now, they're, they have the non-owner ownership rules been relaxed, and so there's a lot of action happening in this particular dimension in the U.K. You know, again, a lot, you know, a lot of percolation, whether it turns into stuff, right? you know, that's an open question. Um, sorry about that. I, I was assuming, I even though I was told that, you know, but I, I forgot once I stood up here. So I think what, what we really see happening is this is the move that is happening, it's data-driven law practice. So what happens right now, most instances, is we throw all human expertise at a problem and no data, roughly speaking. That's basically how people practice law today. And so imagine we're going to slide on a continuum. This is not about machines replacing all lawyers or any sort of hyper hyperbolic content, uh, uh, concept like that. But just basically if you went from all to less than all, that's the direction we're heading. And obviously I'm teeing up. Uh, Lex Machina is being one of a set of examples of this idea, but uh, I want you know I want to orient you to that because I think you know over the next 35 years of for for you know many of you might have a special law students here 35 year career this is going to be part of your future. Before talking about law though, I just want to orient everyone a little bit about some broad trends that are driving all of this. So this may be old hat to some of you, but if it's not, it's okay. So uh, uh, this, this is the era of big data, so-called big data. Now, nothing in law is really, really big data, like in the true sense. And obviously, that's a contingent concept, to say the least. But just relative to where it's been, it's big data for, for law. But relative to anecdotes and ends of one, it's, a, it's big data. So the, what is driving that? Increasing computing power, decreasing data storage costs. Those are fundamentally opening up the set of scientific inquiry and technical possibilities. <coughs> This point was first made really in this nature, um, special edition of nature in 2008. This is sort of like where you get sort of the root of this whole term that, you know, uh, landed in, in something that's called computational social science by social scientists. Um, then it sort of crosses over into more mainstream outlets like The Economist. Um, then another issue of science. I call this the watershed moment. So McKinsey went out and told all of their sort of, you know, high, their, their sort of top, top level clients, hey, big data is the next thing. And that's really where it sort of percolated out to a lot wider audience. And so that, that's sort of like the watershed moment. It's definitely like a serious uptick in the, in the, or what's going on out there, hopefully. Everyone's okay. Um, <laughs> so what's driving this big data revolution? Well, this is the one half that I just showed you before. And, uh, we've been doubling the speed of a processor every 18 to 36 months since uh, you know since the 19 really since the 1950s, but but certainly uh, uh, so every time you double a large number, double it again and double it again and double it again and double it again, you're having you're you're riding exponential growth. Um, that's one half of the equation. Just to just give you a little taste of the other half. Okay, well, how big is big? What are they talking about? Nothing in law is really at the high end of the possibility spectrum, but it's just you know worth noting. Um, so, petabyte, petabyte, whatever you want to call it. So, 1,024 gigs is a terabyte, 1,024 terabytes. You can buy a terabyte drive, two terabyte drive at the Apple Store or whatever, no problem. Um, that's available at the retail level. Um, this is just to show you what's happened with a gig. The gig has had you know, exponential decay or exponential decrease. So, in 1981, that would have been a very valuable thing to have a gig. Gig of storage, 300,000 bucks. $0.10 cents in 2011, today maybe $0.07, cents, $0.06, cents, you know, whatever, some, you know, approximately. So that's that exponential decay you're riding, and exponential growth this way, exponential decay going that way. And so just to give you a little bit of context of what all that means, back when Facebook had 100 billion photos, that's about 15 petabytes of storage. And uh, this is my favorite, just from a text perspective, and this is text, the entire written works of mankind for the beginning of recorded history in every language is 50 petabytes. Just to give you a, a benchmark. Now, colossal storage, big company storage space, they're about, they say, you know, two to five years, you'll be able to buy a petabyte drive 
for $750. So back of the napkin, $37,500 you in principle could store the entire written works of humanity in all languages for all recorded time. That's what they kind of mean when they say big data. That's a fundamental class. Like, that doesn't mean you can do stuff with it. That, we'll talk about that in a second. But that's just the, the possibility frontier is opening up. It's, a, it's up to all of us to figure out how to make use of that. That's, the, that's why you have a class like this and, and it keeps going on. But things that seem impossible become possible mighty fast when you have exponential growth and exponential decay. So this is a point that, this is sort of on the labor market side of things. This is a, a point that's pushed pretty hard in Race Against the Machine. This is a book I encourage you to read. It's not very long, it's less than 200 pages long and it's written by um, uh, uh, two labor economists at MIT. And the basic thrust of the book is not just, it's not really just race against the machine, it's also race with the machine. So it's about the future of work and the role of a whole range of these technologies that are transforming what, you know, white collar work is, is sort of, as they view it, next up in the ways that, you know, while I live in Michigan, the way that the Rust Belt really was, uh, was transformed by, by automation in the uh, uh, 1970s and 1980s. One, one point they make, or they highlight, this is a classic problem, they highlight uh, the wheat and chessboard problem, we, you know, also, uh, uh, so this, this is a sort of story about exponential growth, and it's been told in a lot of different cultures, different ways, but just to give you the high level version, there's a person who invents chess, goes to the emperor, and, and uh, uh, the emperor is so happy by the game of, the game of chess, allows the, uh, the inventor to name the prize that the person would want, and so the the inventor, being very wise, says, uh, I just would like a grain of rice for the first square on the board, and two grains of rice for the second, and four for the third, and eight for, and so forth and so on. And the emperor is, is greatly offended because he's asked for such a, not, you know, minuscule uh, 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 reward. And of course, the emperor's mistake is he's using all some, he's linearizing the distance that's truly, that's exponential, and if you, you know, take the sum, in summation of all of this, it's a pile of rice the size of Mount Everest. And so they tell it in different ways. One, the person gets uh, executed by the emperor. But the, the one I like better is he, this person, become, the, the inventor becomes the emperor. I like that one better. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so the, 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 the reason this story is useful is two things. One, it sort of shows you that we all have this linear heuristic that we use. We tend to linearize distances between things. And we do it actually because it works for a lot of problems. A lot of things in the, in the world, actually, the distances are linear. And so it's a good approximation in a lot of contexts. What happens, though, is if the underlying function is exponential, you get it wrong. You get it wrong, and you're off by a lot. And just, this is a point they make in the book, is they say, look, uh, we're heading into the second half of the chessboard. We're <coughs> heading into the part where every jump forward is a massive jump forward. And just to sort of give you a visual, I mean, this is linear growth. Between A and B, when you're at B, looking back towards A, these two functions look approximately the same. You don't actually know that the one isn't different from the other. Only as you move from B to C is it clear that that's exponential growth and not linear growth. So what they sort of posit is what's happened now is we're moving from B to C. That second half of the chessboard, these jumps are really big. And um, so whether they're right or not, you know, remains to be seen. It's forecasting about the future. But, but, uh, but it is, you know, it is, this is a sort of uh, something I would just tell you about to orient yourself a little bit to, um, you know, to, to, what's, to what's going on. So every time we double processor speed, every time we have data storage costs, things open up in a nonlinear, massive sort of way. Okay, but the thing is, is that's only half the story. Having a lot of data is not, in and of itself, a useful thing. It's about, you know, for, for something like law, it's about turning into something that's useful for um, clients or for lawyers or for, the, for society. And so that takes you into this computation and AI. And so, you know, someone said the AI revolution is on, but it's not what we thought. This is sort of, was the first sort of magazine article really to push this point. But basically, you know, we have things like this here. We can talk a little bit about this and its applicability. But uh, um, this is the, uh, this is Watts and the Jeopardy playing uh, a machine that, that beat the two champions, this is the two greatest champions in the history of Jeopardy. And um, there's, you know, there's a lot to say about this, um, and I, you know, I could go, go into some detail about, you know, what, what parts of law is this applicable to or not, but I will tell you what they're working on a lot is medicine. And they're interested in medicine, I've talked to uh, a person who used to be in charge, uh, it's, listen, uh, medicine's worth trillions of dollars, law's worth billions, 
it's in the product cycle, but not in, not in our immediate sites. Um, they, they're, they're trying to, they've been teaching Watson to take the medical boards, mm -hmm. among other things. So one thing I just want to say is that the AI revolution on, is on, but it's not what we thought. It's not robots having empathy or something like that that they present you in the movies. Although uh, I've heard Peter Thiel talk about this, uh, you know, robots having empathy piece. So you can just file an addendum or an asterisk next to this. But, but you know, <laughs> more generally, I just want to say, like, what is clearly happening, like, in the, right now is this sort of soft artificial intelligence. So this is mimicking, <clears throat> maybe not using the same underlying process, but mimicking sort of in result the types of things that humans are doing. Um, so one of the things that lawyers do a lot is predict things. And so the question is, is there's human-centric prediction, there's data-driven prediction, and actually the, the right answer to the problem is the proper ensemble of human expertise. The, the, the proper ensemble of the two will be either for most problems. We can talk about that in a minute. And just to push this a little bit more, this is just, you know, somebody from right around here, why software is eating the world. Um, um, so, you know, he's his companies in every uh, industry should need to assume that a software revolution is coming. I think for law, the uh, revolution is already here. And so, and that's why you're in this class. Why the rest of your colleagues aren't in this class is really beyond me, but you know, uh, too bad for them. I'm looking at you. Uh, so, so the, the first thing I go, you know, I go out and talk to a lot of lawyers, I mean a lot of lawyers, and I'm, I'm all over the place. And the first thing they say, with literally, typically zero actual knowledge about the space or what's possible or whatever, that this is what they say. And it's more of a hope when they say it than a, like, oh, I know this space and this, you know. You can't replace what I do with a computer. And I ask, why are you so confident that that's true? You know, based on your deep expertise in the area, you know what's possible and what isn't? And one thing, the way to think about it is, is how, it's about you know, how many people do we used to do it, how many people now? My view is that there's going to be a real split. You know, there's a set of people who are, who are leveraging data, who are going to be like bionic, basically. You're going to, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then that there's a, about a separation that will take place. Uh, between there will be a haves and haves nots, and um, maybe you'll be a part of the haves. <laughs> okay, it, uh, so it's useful, I think, to consider industries where human reasoning used to, was paramount, and um, this is popular right now because of the new Michael Lewis book. But finance is an industry where qualitative human reasoning used to reign supreme. Not anymore. For better or for worse, I can call a book. I don't have enough time to talk about the worst part, but 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 you know, I'm not signing up and saying this is not a normative talk. This is a positive talk. Okay, we can talk about the normative components in great detail offline, but but as a sort of positive matter, quants dominate the industry in finance. So it's more than half now. This is a conservative estimate of trades in New York Stock Exchange are done algorithmically. So there's been a lot of coverage of this. Um, my friend Mike Bomarito, who's a frequent collaborator, has this talk. Um, and this is a, we, have, we have all the videos of our events at, at Reinvent Law Channel, but you know, talking about the relationship between law and finance, which we think is a pretty strong one for a certain class of problems that lawyers do. Of course, what lawyers do is a very diverse set of things. And so anybody says, well, let me give you an essential characterization. It's too diverse for an essential characterization. But there are, there are tranches of work that look a hell of a lot like this. Um, so here's another one, just to, just to orient you. It's the DARPA challenge. 2004, which is driverless cars. Build a driverless car that went 150 miles. In 2004, the winning uh, uh, car went eight miles and got hung up on a rock. But you keep doubling processor speed, half data storage costs, get cheaper and cheaper sensor technology, and this is what you get. And this is what it, this is the point that again they make a risk against machine. It, it's exponential. People thought it'd be you know coming out of 2004, then it'd be 2040 before we got something, and it was a lot faster than that. And that's because of they they argue because we're sliding across an exponential. Now let's switch over to law for a moment. It's not a binary proposition. That's weak argumentation if I've ever seen it, right? You get these lawyers, it's like, supposed to be some fancy lawyers giving me some binary argument as though it's, the, it's a continuous space. So let's try to not do that, okay? So computers certainly cannot do everything, but displacing 20 or 30% of the current workload seems to me to be a very, very plausible sort of state of the world. That's a pretty damn big deal. 20, 30% of the existing work now, new markets can get created, new subsets of work get created, and we're already seeing that. And I just flagged you, this is sort of an idea that I pitched in the paper, you know. Maybe we have 70 folks today, and we have 70 folks tomorrow kind of doing the same thing they always did. Then we have this other part of the workspace that just, you know, is, easy, is very susceptible. And this has already happened, right? Discovery used to be an all-human process. Now there's a lot less humans in it. 
but there are people with certain types of expertise who manage those types of processes and will manage other ones. And so there's new work being created, but you have to have a different set of skills than the ones that are historically were privileged. Okay? So that, to me, is a very, and then this is sort of tech and law, sort of a person who's mainly a tech, maybe a technical person, but has some uh, domain knowledge that allows them to work in that, that sort of hybrid in-between space. One thing is, obviously, a lot of people are making plays in this area, and it's something I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention. We have that you know, huge untapped market, 70% of the country doesn't have a lawyer, including people who are willing to pay something, but we have a lousy business model to deliver them services. So the question, the big play, the biggest play of all, is to try to crack that. A bunch of middle class people who can't, a bunch of middle class lawyers who say, quote, I can't, aff I can't afford to hire myself. Right? I'm too expensive to hire myself. That's a business problem, right? And so, you know, there are a variety of people working on that problem. Uh, um, but I just wanted to, I, I, I couldn't leave here without at least mentioning that. And that that's great. Thanks. Yes. Well, I have a whole class on that. Okay, good. Well, I, I would really encourage you. I mean, you know, you can do a lot of good for, your, for yourself, for the profession, and for a lot of folks out there who have to go it alone. Because they don't, you know, they, they face a pot, the sort of horrible prospects of paying a lot of money they're not willing to reasonably speaking, or just, you know, roll on their own. Because these are things that I think are going to be what it means to be a lawyer going forward, at least in part. And this is, should be familiar to some of you, my CS people, right? This is ML, NLP, a bunch of, you know, CS stuff. The great time to be a person that lives at the intersect of those two things. That's a great time. It's never too, learn, too late to learn, too. Never too late to learn. If Andrew Conway has this, I like it. Uh, you know, got too much of this in the field, not enough of that. So that's because most law schools are liberal arts colleges, not polytechnics. More on that in a second. Uh, so what's the next big thing, in my view? Quantitative legal prediction. So this has been percolating up. Some of us starting here, surely. Uh, 2013 is where it starts to really accelerate. So three things I want you to know about prediction. Three key ideas I want you to know about prediction. Inverse problem, system dynamics, and a basic idea about how machines learn at a high level without any math. Okay. So mainstream of science, right, is testing hypotheses, right? Mainstream of science is hypothesis testing. Deductive methods, okay? Now, okay? This is the alternative, induction. But we can talk about the problem of induction, you know, so this con, you know, fourth quadrant knowledge, you know, unknown unknowns, right? The Rumsfeldian, you know, right? But that's the alternative, induction. And that's really a lot the, the, the weakness, but also the, the engineering feat is to basically work with induction and live with it, even though it ha you're exposing yourself. And I just want to be clear about this. You're exposing yourself. It's deductive, you know, the unknown unknown can still kill you. But this is just, just it is what it is. So another way of uh, talking through this is, you know, an inverse problem. That might be something that's familiar to people. But basically, what, what is the idea? Use data to pull the rules out of something or pull the parameters out of something, not take parameters and fit a function. But, I mean, you're, you're doing that, but it's really that you start from data. It's sort of a data-first strategy. Now, obviously, this is iterative, right? And this is a big debate, right? I'm, I'm right on a fault line of a huge argument. Right? But I just want you to know that like, the basic conceptual is an argument back and forth between these students. Both things are valid, by the way. Both things are valid. But the point is, is most of what approaches you're seeing that people are sort of breaking through on are more of this data-driven approach. Anyway, so I just want you to know, in case you didn't know, that this is an inductive age. A lot of problems are getting solved by throwing a ton of data at something. Um, what I like the best is this, because I'm a horrible speller. Now, that's AI of a very, very red, low-grade sort. I like to say this is the age of aspirational spelling. Yeah. You know, if you can aspire to spell something, it's as though you can spell it. <laughs> Which is good news for me, because I'm a horrific speller. But I don't need to spell. I need to know enough grammar to be able to throw something in there, and a billion clicks will, will send me to the right answer. A bunch of other of these pri problems are really, it's data first, okay? Now there's a whole range of issues associated with that, and I don't want, I, I'm not just here to totally evangelize that, 
Part of what you should do in a class like this is understand the, criti the critical issues that are attendant to this. But I just want you to know the basic orientation so you know the debate. So what do you do? Induce a plausible model from existing data and then try to validate your model. That's basically ML. That's what people do, right? So you're either going to go out of sample and or forward predict. Out of sample would be cut your data set into pieces, build a model on one part, apply it on the rest, say if I had been using this model, how would I do? And then deploy would be forward predict. So if you're doing this in finance, it'd be here's a trading strategy we think would work that we developed. We're going to test it, say, had we been using this, how would we, would we, have, would we have done? And then apply it forward if you, you know, if you so dare in the market. So, other piece, system dynamics. This is something just worth noting about the nature of prediction in any context. I want you to, you know, I, I spent a bunch of time in complex systems, University of Michigan. It's probably the best place, maybe best place in the world other than Santa Fe Institute for, for complex systems. And I just want to give you a basic orientation at a high level. This is a complex system, weather, okay? And we try to forecast the weather. We try to predict the weather. Here's another one. Also a complex system. Also something we try to predict. Tides. Now it turns out that tides are pretty easy and predictable, even though the dynamics that instantiate that are pretty complex. Weather, by contrast, is, pretty, is, is, is much harder to predict. Out, now, it depends on the exact dynamics of where, uh, 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 of what time of the year you're at. Like in Michigan right now, it could be 25 or it could be 75. And it has been 25 and almost 70 in the last few weeks. So, you know, it's a high, there's a lot of variability around the, when the seasons are, are switching. Now, you go back to January and it's like this. And it's all cold, right? Same thing in Arizona in July or something. It's just hot up here. It's just like that. Outside of about 10 days... An almanac, your, your, probably, your, the, your ability to predict basically <laughs> converges on an almanac. That's what an almanac's about is good. But don't think that an almanac wasn't a big deal in human history. Here's agriculture production. Here's an almanac. It was a damn big deal. People knew when to print their crops. They did better. No one walks around with an almanac though and says it's going to rain at 430. It's just that, that the caliber prediction that's possible is just not the same with an almanac. But... I'd want, you know, if you have an almanac and the other person doesn't, you will do better in the long run. That's the sort of lesson, again, with, ag with agriculture production. A lot of problems in law look a lot more like weather than tides. And I just want to, I want you to have the appropriate skepticism about what is happening so that you, you know, you don't, you don't become a true believer more than you should about models, okay? So this is like the orientation. I just, this is like, you know, what I might do in 14 weeks in uh, four minutes. So, okay. So there's a technical treatment of this question. How hard is something to predict in various contexts? I, I really like this Best and Johnny paper a lot. Uh, okay. So machine learning is the hard predictive analytics. And I just want to give you a tiny taste of that. A lot of problems in law, the empirical legal studies in, in law schools, is really interested in cause and effect. Quite appropriately, right? And when we have a public program and we want to know, did this thing actually you know, do the things we thought it did? You know, then you really want to pin down cause and effect in a serious way. And you get obsessed with cause and effect. And it, so like, you know, most of these econometric methods people use, you know, reg regression discontinuity, matching methods, a whole range of things. It's all, and because people want to pin this down. Or they're worried about reverse causality, so you see instrument variables. There's a whole bunch of this type of stuff. This is a little bit different, right? It's a little bit different. Because we're interested in trying to predict something. We're less interested in pinning down cause and effect. In fact, there are models we call black box models. Where we're, you know, that, in fact, we don't, that's not even the point. It's not possible. You know, we don't, we don't, it's not that well specified. So this is just a little bit of a conceptual distinction. I'm just trying to help you see the way for you know, where things fit into the world. Um, so I teach this basic class, but this is basically all about machine learning. Legal analytics at Michigan State is machine learning for lawyers. And we're teaching that right now. Last, last two weeks of natural language processing. But uh, these are just a little bit of taste for some of the methods and some of the approaches. Um, this is how we start the class. So scikits and Python, but I love this graph. I just love it because it basically lays out most of the methods that people have ever heard of are basically on this graph. And you start up here and you just sort of work through and it helps you sort of get an idea of where you need to go. You know, do I have label data? Do I not? Uh, um, am I trying to predict a quantity? Am I trying to predict uh, um, a, a category? What just happened? Okay, we're back. I to walk away for two seconds, that's it, you're done. Um, if you just zoomed out a little bit, and we didn't, 
this is basically the four categories. The coloring is not as good as on my computer, but um, most of the things that you're seeing in the prediction space are this, this, and this. Less on that, although that sometimes becomes an issue because we have some high, really high dimensional data in the law sometimes. Okay. So, quick example of some of the methods. Take a look at these 12 objects. We've got some, got a, some animals there, we've got different types of people, we have different parameters, age, keeping it simple here, age, gender, and I don't know, um, uh, uh, species. Okay. Now, classification is about trying to, binary classification is about trying to put them in two types of groups. And here, we're trying to separate by gender. So we try to build a function that will separate the two classes. In regression, we're trying to figure out a quantity. And so we might be interested in age, something like age. And so you can see how, you know, what we forecast and what the true number was. That's what you're doing in regression. And in multi-class, it's just you're trying to cut them into pieces. So something like, you know, do I give this person a loan application? It might be a multi-class problem. And in clustering, we're trying to cluster them by some group. And so like um, one area where this stuff's being used a lot already is in e-discovery, particularly this and this, where the decision, I'll show you that in a second, but um, I just want to give you the thesis of today. Human prediction is one hallmark of the legal industry. Why are you reading all those cases? Well, that may be an existential question, but, uh, uh, but I'll answer it for you. You're reading all those cases so that you can turn around and predict in part. That's part of, we're trying to orient you so that you can basically induce the new answer in, in a context that hasn't been previously considered. So somebody comes in to you with a, with a problem that they've described and they say, oh, well, here's, here are the legal issues that are attended to your problem and, and, uh, and that's basically the mechanism that, that's being used. So, you're, so somebody comes and says, do I have a case? Or well, what's our exposure? What are we looking at? That's a prediction. And um, the race for the future of the industry is to mimic the behavior of expert reasoners, lawyers. And, but to do it at a highly aggregated scale. One thing is, what do I mean by that? Humans are actually pretty amazing pattern detectors. You're a really good pattern detector. Some of like the, the InfoViz plays in this area that we're seeing, like uh, Ravel or whatever, uh, and, and others, they're trying to say your visual cortex is a very powerful CPU. If I can serve up data with patterns, you can use your visual cortex to actually sort of you know, discern those patterns and make sense of them in a way that's useful as a lawyer. Um, this is one of the weaknesses you have, is aggregation. How do you aggregate 10,000 points, 100,000 data points, a million data points? Well, the truth is you don't do that. You don't aggregate. You reduce the problem space to something you can manage. Hashtag heuristics. You're going to use a rule of thumb to reduce the problem somehow so that you can actually manage it. And that's your, one of your weaknesses as a human. You have also a whole range of other cognitive biases. Humans plus machines is better than humans or machines. That's the pseudocode for this talk. For a wide range of prediction problems. So it's not zero humans, or all humans are all machines. It's, you know, you are able to detect things that are hard to instantiate in a statistical model. But you have these cognitive biases and these aggregation problems, which means that if you were able to leverage and offset your biases and your lack of ability to aggregate with technology, it's like you, you, get, you get to have it both ways. Yes? Doesn't that sort of suggest the role of the lawyer in what you're envisioning is not, do I have a case, but what type of case do I have? It, it, that, that's part of it. Case, case typing, early case assessment, which is, this is really going to tee up uh, what Lex Machina is going to talk about in part. Yes, it does. And it really, to me, it, sh it shifts what you think about what lawyers do. So it looks more like an analyst position. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. In fact, if you're supposed to be delivering excellence to your clients, why wouldn't you want to use the maximum amount of information you can? That's the sort of, and I'll just make it as simple as, if you're in there trying to pitch to a client why you should represent them, and you're using data, and, you're, and somebody else pitches and isn't, I think it's a more convincing presentation if you're the client, to hear somebody say, and we'll, you know, that, again, I'm just you know, I'm putting the ball right on the tee, they can take it from here, but, um, okay. So quantitative legal prediction has already begun, and I just wanna highlight in the remaining time, I have a bunch of different areas where it's already happening. This isn't like theoretical, there's a lot of theory in this, but they, is this occurring? Is, well, we're already way past that. Genie is definitely out of the bottle here. And it's going to continue to move up the, va the value chain, in my view. Maybe there's some intrinsic limit to it. Maybe there, you know, there probably are, but we can talk about that if you like. 
So this is place probably most well known for the use of predictive analytics. Why? Because, well, first thing to know, e-discovery, there's a RAND study that says it's about half the cost of litigation in America is discovery, and it's all e-discovery. Every, basically every document is born digitally now in a business, and so 97% of business records are born digitally. So all discovery is basically e-discovery. So you get in a lawsuit, this is just for the CS folks, they get in a lawsuit and they say, I want you to produce all relevant documents to this particular matter. Well, the problem is, is a large, any large to medium sized company, they the emails, they've got all these emails, and a lot, there's a lot of cruft in there. So it's a pretty hard, you know, it's a hard retrieval problem. You have, what are the relevant documents out of the sea of other, of we're having cake on the fourth floor or whatever is in your email right now? You know, I gotta get through all that to find the one that's like backdate and options, you know, like that's the one that you have to produce, unfortunately for you or your client. But, um, so this has been one of the deepest incursions of technology in the law. One, because the pain point was amazingly high, and two, you know, the ability to use straightforward, you know, applications of, tech, of well developed technology in other domains was there. And so, if you go to like legal tech or any of the, vet, the trade shows, there's a West Coast legal tech that's happening in uh, a couple months down in Los Angeles. It's e discovery, e discovery, e discovery, e discovery, e discovery, e discovery. Why? Well, first of all, because that's where the money is. There's tons of, there's a lot of money in because there's a lot of those cases. That's where all the, that's the cost center of the case. It's doing discovery. That used to be the entry point for a lot of people in the big law. Document review. You know, it's like you got, you got, um, you had to, you got hazed by the, by big law by sitting in a where, warehouse or air, aircraft hangar reading documents, saying, oh, this is relevant, this is not. This is relevant, relevant, not relevant, not relevant, right? And so people, they could monetize your, you know, salary by basically charging people for you to review documents. That's not really generally available for a lot of problems now. Other, these are the bigger companies, and there's a lot of smaller companies in this place. I just want to say that, like, that's, is main, that's super mainstream now. It didn't used to be. And it dominates, when you get, it dominates the industry. Now, how was it 20 years ago without the... Well, we didn't have... The, the emails data. made it... So the email yeah, so, was the breaking point. Because yeah. the thing is... It was real when there were just for documents that were produced. It's one thing, but the just sheer volume of emails, and they all they had to be reviewed, made it so that it was just impossible to not have a technology but solution. That's not the solution, the discovery, because the problem wasn't here 20 years ago. Um, it, what do you mean? The, the problem is the amount of email. Right, that's right. But I mean, people were willing to <laughs> finance human review of documents when the document set, set set was small. Now the document set's so large, it's not practical to put humans on. You know, go million, review 1.7 million emails with humans. Wait till you see the bill for that. Yeah, but the problem should be reducing the number of email and not solving it by e-discovery. Well, that's essentially what I'll show you predictive okay. coding does. You're trying to reduce the set of emails that you need to review. Yeah, but re reduce the number of email. Well, that, that's telling not, That's telling somebody in, an e, in, a, in a company that stops sending emails. Yeah, but that's well, they, they tend to not go along with that. Uh, you I, know. I don't know. Okay, I told you, stop yeah. sending all those emails. Yeah, why not? Uh, you can. I, uh, 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 but, you know, most people will say, uh-huh, and then they'll just keep sending the emails. Yeah, when I started to work, there was no email at all. I understand that. Uh, 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 I, again, this was, it, it was one thing when you were sending written correspondences to one another. There was a finite number of your ability, the public, the, the was the world worse? I, I, this isn't a normative presentation. Uh, I, I don't know what it was relative to this. this. I'm just telling you is a practical solution to a problem. Prediction is what people are doing because they do not want to do human review of these documents. Mm -hmm. And so predictive coding, so-called predictive coding, is really binary classification, by the way, of course. So this is like one thing in the CS to law. This is some term that was made up for marketing purposes in law, but it's really binary classification, just so we're clear. Relevant or not relevant? That's the question. You have an obligation to turn over every relevant document to the other side, but most of, the, of your emails are not relevant to whatever's happening. But somebody has to review them to say that they are not relevant. So there's two approaches. Have humans do it or have machines do it, and so people have opted for this. This is the major, this is sort of in the last two to three years case law in this area that's being developed. And that's sliding across this spectrum. More and more people are trying to make deeper incursions that way. But what they do now is supervise learning. So this is what people want to do. They want to move to there, just like in every problem of this type. They want to go there. Now, there's, you know, the question is, what's, what is necessary to go there? Question mark. What is the naive informed access? Well, one of the things that most of the providers don't do is they don't learn across instances. 
which is you might seem crazy, but what um, they don't if if I've reviewed one company's documents, I don't they, they usually don't put embed that and then say, well, let's use that as a starting point on the next set of, of Corpa. So that would be moving from this. They pretend like everyone's a new, which you know no one else would do, but there's reasons that they don't do it because the people have concerns that you know that uh, uh, like privacy concerns or you know the lawyers have concerns. So this is just something people are trying to do, but it hasn't. That's the naive to informed in this context. Um, so if I just did one company that's kind of in your sector, and now I do another. The kind of the things that would tend to be relevant here are probably they're somewhat similar there, but people are not using the fact that they already know that. Um, yes. So these legal fields incorporate a lot of the CS techniques, like. Machine yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I mean, you're getting a highly slanted view today. I would say that it's it's like a the theory of tiny fraction of things currently do, but this is one place where it just became impossible to deal with the problem without some some CS, because the amount of money it would cost to do these review doc reviews with humans is in, it, like insane amounts of money. And again, it was the cost center of most litigation is discovery. <coughs> Um, so just just this is for uh, the non CS people. Keep going. Oh, sorry. And for the legal fields that do incorporate those techniques, how well does the legal field uh, actually keep up with, I suppose, new advancements in machine learning or animal? Not learning? amazingly, but uh, uh, they've now gone from not having any of this to some of it, which is a pretty big step, I'll have to say. Uh, um, you know, again, relative to where they were, and it's really out of necessity, uh, cost necessity. It's also that they've done these tournaments where they put human reviewers against uh, against some binary classification, um, and, and the, the, hum the humans do worse than the than the. I mean, humans do not do as well on doc review as advertised. That's one of the big takeaways, and they're actually missing a lot of documents that they should get. And then you know, there's obviously precision and recall uh, elements. Yes. I was wondering if you think there's some incentive in e-discovery because if you're a big corporate defendant, um, you might have an incentive to keep a na uh, naive system that has to do a lot of discovery rather sure. than something that can immediately pinpoint stuff that would damage your case. Yeah, that's that's right. That's right. Um, that uh, uh, that's that they have. There's been a lot of people trying to to stop the advances of these. The thing is, though, that if you're one of these large defendants, you also have to pay the bill because there's usually not cost shifting. You have to pay the bill to do the review. It cuts both ways. Um, you know, the, the major case in this is Zubilaki involving UBS. And UBS has, this is an employment, uh, gender discrimination complaint. So it's just this huge amount of communications at the bank. And reviewing them was going to be incredibly costly for the bank. The bank had to bear the cost in the case. And so this is the other side of the coin. Is the fact that you have to eat the cost maybe why, you know, why you're, you're prepared to consider these types of alternatives. Um, so just to give you an overview, but prediction, um, predictive coding is binary classification. Yes. So do you think that the market will determine these kind of technologies to be advanced in the legal industry? What's that? The market will determine, right? The I don't know. If, uh, yeah, I mean, this is what people are doing. And I'm just giving you one, one I mean, this e-discovery is civil procedure plus technology, basically. That's what it is. It's your CivPro class where you probably didn't talk nearly enough about discovery. Never, never, they never talk enough about it. Because it's like where all the action basically is. Again, most of the cost is there. Most of the lawyer time is there. Anyway, uh, uh, take this sample set of, uh, 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 as a training set and use human experts. And then um, use the experts, and that's the supervision part. So what they do is they code a subset of the documents using humans. And then in a simple case, you apply it and assign it to two piles. Again, this is for our non-CS folks. Take human coders. Imagine those are the document set. It would obviously be a lot bigger. Okay, yellow ones are relevant. We separate the relevant and not relevant into two piles. And this is the key thing we're trying to learn. What is it that allows the human to separate the two things? So you can think of it this way. If I gave you some spam, and I've served it up to you, and I said, okay, I want you to put the spam in one pile and the not spam in another. And like, I mean, I can bring, you'll look at the thing for no time flat, and you'd easily say, oh, that's spam, that's definitely spam. Like that fast, right? So what is it that allowed you? What is it that you led you to that initial, that immediate characterization? What we're trying to do is basically <coughs> build a statistical model that's replicating what you're doing there. Yes? Before you do that process, is it good practice, or should you generally make sure the computer knows a whole lot about those documents? What we're trying to do is we're going to put humans on this part of the task, and what we're going to try to do is induce or learn the what separates this from that. 
Sure, but you can't learn that unless you have if you know a lot of the characteristics about those documents. Right, and so this gold standard becomes really critical. This first step, making sure this is high quality, is very important. In fact, I would say, like, you know, when I advise, they spend too little on this, relatively speaking, because what happens is you're propagating, this is going to be what you're going to use to bootstrap all the rest or to jump off for the rest. So making sure this is correct is really critical. And sometimes they try to short shrift on this step, and it really hurts them in terms of the back end. Um, so what we're trying to mimic, and I, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. I mean, there's whole. I mean, I teach a whole class on e-discovery, and there may be one here. I don't know. Um, there should be, if there isn't, uh, in my view, because it's a huge part of litigation in the United States and globally. Um, when you look at the vendors, they're all basically selling an undifferentiated product. Um, humans are selecting on features of documents and to place them in the respective bins. These are some of the features that would lead you to the characterization. You know, and there's things that you would tell me in a second would allow you to classify something as spam. Same thing with the documents in this context. So again, relevant versus not relevant. By the way, same thing, privilege versus not privilege. You, you want to run through your documents no matter what with a system like this. Make sure something privileged doesn't slip out. And there are features that are tend to be not, the problem is every lawyer puts at the bottom that this thing is privileged even if they're, you know, telling you when soccer practices or something like that. Um, and we try to learn a rule or boundary that separates these things. So this is the sort of workflow. You want to take what you learn there and apply it to the rest of the corpus. And then that would allow you then to say, okay, these are the ones, the yellow ones that we reveal from here are the ones I have to produce. And you might roll humans through on the subset, just to verify, you know, you may do that or you may not. Again, to the extent your client's willing to pay people, of course, the law firm's happy to put humans on the problem. It's just that the clients have gotten sophisticated and know that they've outsourced a lot of this away from law firms for good reason. Uh, we can talk about that. Um, so here's a bunch of other areas I'll run through real fast where prediction's being used. Buying legal services, legal procurement. This is at the high end of the market. There's this company called Timemetrics. There's other ones in the space. They have all of this billing data from all of these general counsels of large companies, and they're trying to figure out, you know, where are the best deals in the legal market? And there's all these trade-offs that exist. But basically, this is a way to do labor arbitrage. And so, you know, there you can download this app if you want. This is just the simple stuff. They have fancier stuff on, on, underneath the hood. Um, this is just a little regression model to give you a little taste for it. But basically, you know, trying to figure out how to get your legal services for less, this is an like analytics company that sort of sits in between there. Okay? Predicting judicial decisions. Ten years ago, there was this tournament done between experts and a model. And one thing I just want to point out, this was like Supreme Court clerks and high-end law professors from fancy schools and stuff like that, and they got obliterated by a pretty straightforward model. Uh, um, that's really bad because they reverse 61% of the cases they hear. So the, a two-line co of, of code would basically on an expectation exceed this prediction. So they're overfitting like a real bad way. Um, so just, just a classification tree. I'm going to jump past actually just for a long time. Uh, I'm doing an extension of that paper as we speak to try to generalize the model to every year the Supreme Court ever. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. What people want to do is predict outcomes and disputes. That's over here. Um, the client's first question is something like, do I have a case? How, and then the question is, how are you generating that assessment? How does a human reason arrive at that conclusion for doing things like this? Particular, you know, you spend a lot of time doing that, but the reason by analogy, pattern matching, pattern protection. This is kind of the, the big setup across. This is what, this is the immediate future as I see it. Humans plus machines are better than human or machines. This is the whole ball game, of course, right there. Um, so here's some examples. IP litigation, here we are. Securities fraud litigation, this is a paper worth taking a look at. I cite it in the paper. Here's a company that's working in negotiations. How much should I offer and win in the negotiation process? There's a video on our channel about that. Transactional work, so in the contract space. Due diligence. It's coming up fast. Lawyer quality and performance. I don't even have AVBO in here. And I'll just finish by showing you, look, as was rolling started by mentioning, BC's really turning to legal, and I'll just roll through these real fast. $458 million, $200 million of which is legal zone, but 
Um, there's a lot of money coming into this into this space right now, and so um, and there's a lot more in this space. But I'm going to stop there and allow us to take to take our yeah, to take our break. Elizabeth, take it away. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, some Is this a, the firing squad? Am I? Am I? Yeah, <laughs> take the take the punch. Okay. No, but you can you can ask your questions later too. But I think that would be a good. Okay. Yeah. Good I guess my main question is: It seems like from this that there's like all this technology and a lot of you know kind of innovation that's possible. But it seems that like kind of law schools and um, kind of more the AMLAW 50 firms are a little bit reticent to kind of go down these roads because it means a lot of changes, means going down roads that they don't necessarily understand. Yeah. How do you think that you can like kind of um, encourage some of these more mainstream firms and mainstream law schools to kind of realize that technology is a good thing rather than something that could, you know, totally involve having to shake up their business models and change the way that they, you know, maybe compensate themselves, for instance? As a person not at one of the uh, elite law schools, I'd say I hope they do nothing. If they keep doing what they're doing, keep on keeping on. And we'll we'll just go ahead and have 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 our you know if we're the Oakland A's in the money ball of this example. I mean I'm at Yankee Stadium right here having this conversation, but uh, uh, you know so you know, so obviously I have a little bit of a particular reason for not wanting that to happen. But you know of course you, you guys are on on, on that here now. Uh, uh, I mean, I feel like the market will take care of that. Let the market take care of that. I mean, if those firms don't want to do it, I mean, part of the problem they have is the problem everybody has. If you're making money doing human document review, why wouldn't you? It's it's easy money, right? You just take you hire a bunch of uh, uh, law, law school, school graduates and you put them in having do document review and you make money. I mean, th that's the problem. Without pressure from your client, why would you do it? And and I guess the one thing that's really happened since the fi financial crisis is the clients. The clients, the general counsels of a Fortune 100, have really put a lot of pressure. Not even so much because they want to do it, because the CEO and CFO of those companies said, you're going to cut your budget. And then once you have to cut your budget, you start saying, how, can, how do we do that? And then you, these entrepreneurs and these startups, uh, uh, you know, and um, some of the not as, not AMO 50, but further down the list, start being able to get in the room. I, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to who said, I tried for years to get in the room. I could never get in the room. Then the financial crisis hit, and I could get a meeting. Um, I guess my other question was, um, it seems like a lot of the uh, kind of the ethics rules and that the way we usually practice law might kind of prevent this type of innovation, like you're touching on with Rule 5.4. Yeah. Do you think that given the, you know, kind of, you know, recalcitrance of a lot of the, you know, committees on the judiciary and, you know, the American Bar Association to yeah. change ethics rules even for, from a, like a normative standpoint to make things more, you know, ethical. Do you think that that's realistic anytime soon to see them have tech-driven changes, for example, to the ethics rules? Well, I think people have basically are creative and have found a way to basically operate. The existential threat, right, when I go out and talk to law firms and I tell them about your axioms and your clear spires and what have you is, you now operate in a world where your competitor can raise capital and you can't. That's the worst possible world you could imagine. When they, when you're, when the upstart has a huge, like, structural advantage over you. In, and one thing I just say about Axiom, and you should, you should look at, you know, you should look at them if you don't know about them. Um, you know, I'm not, again, I'm not here to show for one or the other, but I just want you to know something about them. You know, they're already in the AMLA 100 in terms of size. If they keep growing at the rate they're growing, they'll be the largest law firm in the world by 2018. Most people haven't even heard of them. Most law schools that go out, they're like, I don't know who you're talking about. So I just want to point them to you as an example of, uh, right down the street, by the way, on the other end of the market, it's a guy named Raj Abiyankar, who if you don't know about, you should. Because he did the same sort of thing in the trademark space. Startup, run an online trademark search engine, convert people to basically register their marks, ended up being the largest trademark firm in the United States in four years. That's that. The thing is, is the the fact that everybody at you know isn't creative and doesn't work within the rule set. It actually that's their fault, and that's why I feel like the market's going to take care of some of that. Raj will speak here on the twenty. Good, paper. good. You, you, should, you should ask him about his journey. It's really quite something to listen, just to all the things that he's been. He's he's one of the most creative people in this space, bar none. And he's just <laughs> he's right down here on University Avenue, across from the Apple Store. So you can go in and see his retail space. There's sort of like the Apple Store for law. Mm -hmm. A hundred people had that idea, right? Oh, we should do the Apple Store for law. But he did it. That's the difference. A lot of talk. He actually did it. Right. Okay.
I guess I have one more question. Okay, okay no, no. I, that I, was, um, yeah. What would you, what would like your best advice be for somebody, you know, who's kind of like entering big law and, you know, who wants to stay ahead of the curve and not get fired in 20 years? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, like, like uh, here's um, my, uh, uh, there's a woman who works uh, 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 with me, her name's Amani Smathers, and she gave a talk at one of our recent events about T-shaped lawyers, just like this T-shaped professional.